All right, good afternoon. Uh, this is Chris Vivilla with the Waco MPO. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Waco MPO Technical Committee meeting for Thursday, February 4th, 2021. Uh, I have two o'clock in the afternoon. And to verify that uh, we have uh, a sufficient number of members uh, with us today to conduct business, uh, I've asked my staff to uh, verify that we have the requisite number. We'll need one more. We need one more. Okay. Well, uh, then we will be on pause for a second here uh, while we wait for another person to join okay, us. We, ha we have a person that joined us. Okay, before we get all excited, I just have to tell you all I need to leave at 2.30. So I'm apologizing in advance. You might need to get another person to join as well. Okay. Thanks, Amy. Uh, well, since we now have the uh, appropriate number, we'll go ahead and get started, and hopefully we'll have one or two folks join us in, in the meantime. We have had more join us. Okay, awesome. Uh, well, uh, thank you uh, here, uh, and uh, under public comments, which is the next item, uh, we do invite the public to submit comments to us or to register in advance if they want to directly address the technical committee. Uh, as of 10 a.m. this morning, uh, we have not uh, received any such requests, uh, so uh, we do not have anything to read into the record at this time. So we'll jump into our uh, business. Uh, unfortunately, we've got some really difficult uh, topics uh, or complicated topics really uh, to dive into here, uh, each related to performance targets and uh, performance measures uh, that we're, we are required under the Federal FAST Act uh, to monitor. Uh, the first one we're going to dive into is safety targets. This is one of those that we look at on an annual basis uh, and um, the goal here is people should be able to get uh, from point A to point B safely and uh, free from it, uh, any harm. There are five metrics that we track. There's the number of fatalities on an annual basis, uh, a f fatal rate uh, based on uh, how many fatalities per million vehicle miles of travel, uh, number of serious injuries, and then similarly a serious injury rate uh, and serious injuries we define kind of as life-threatening injuries. Uh, and then uh, we combine fatalities and serious injuries for non-motorized uh, modes, basically bicycles and pedestrians. So last year, uh, what we did is, uh, or what the state of Texas did is uh, they set their targets based on a trend line uh, that kept increasing over time, but that uh, we could probably achieve something about 2% less than that uh, relative to doing nothing at all, at all. And I just noticed that our percentages here are actually wrong here. It's not 0.2%, it should just be 2% uh, from the baseline trend. And actually, since it compounds over time, it actually results in an annual decrease of 4%, not 0.4%. Um, and I apologize for that. We just I just noticed that a couple of minutes ago. Um, and then the state of Texas is required to do some assessment about how they are performing relative to those goals. Uh, and then if for whatever reason the state fails to achieve the goals that they've set, uh, then under the federal program, the state of Texas can be required to shift some of their federal dollars to addressing safety issues uh, and basically lose a little bit of flexibility in how you can use your federal dollars. Um, now, the MPO is also re required to do some type of assessment of safety in our region, and we are required to either support the state targets or set some targets that are specific to our particular region. And then from there, we're supposed to look at the mix of projects that we've identified in our through our planning process and identify how those are intended to help uh, either the state achieve their targets or to achieve the specific targets we've adopted ourselves if we decide to go uh, a different route. 
unlike the state, we do not have any uh, uh, implications for failure to meet a target. Um, However, there are some other conversations that may take place if we uh, uh, fall short of what we identify for our region. 2021, uh, things are a little different. Uh, and you know, each set of targets is independent from each other. And this year, the Transportation Commission, uh, well, actually last year, the, well, actually is 2019. Okay, we're, we're getting ahead of our, getting behind here. Um, but the Transportation Commission chose to adopt a, a Vision Zero goal uh, for highway fatalities. And their goal is to get to zero highway fatalities by the year 2050. But what they also did is they adopted their official uh, fatality target to be a trend line from where we were last year down to zero by 2050. So whatever we would would have to achieve this year to be on that trend line is what, what uh, that new target is. And it turns out that's on a statewide basis that would result in a reduction of 684 fatalities relative to last year. What's interesting is uh, TxDOT, however, did not change their targets for serious injuries or non-motorized fatalities and serious injuries. Uh, and so those trend lines and those targets are still increasing. Uh, that has some relevancy for our discussion today. So on the statewide level, what you see here is in red is, is what's different from what we've done or what the state has done in the past. Uh, you see a pretty substantial decrease for fatalities uh, relative to previous. And that, of course, then translates into a pretty substantial decrease in the fatal rate per million vehicle miles of travel. Um, but you see in this 2021 target, the serious injuries keep going up, the non-motorized numbers keep going up. And then the actual target that we're actually taking action on is, is what the five-year average um, would be. And so that not only includes 2021, but the previous four years of actual data. Okay, so uh, we've got uh, some discussion we've got to have on this uh, regarding, uh, is this something that we can continue to support as a region? Uh, and, uh, or do we need to consider something different? So to begin that conversation, we wanted to take a look at what we've actually observed here in McLennan County since 2016, basically the last five years worth of data. Uh, so for fatalities, uh, we generally average somewhere around 36 fatalities a year, uh, which results in a fatal rate of about a little over one fatality for every 100 million mile, uh, vehicle miles of travel. Uh, for serious injuries, we average uh, around 188 annually and that's a serious injury rate of 5.7 or so uh, serious injuries per 100 million vehicle miles of travel. And then for non-motorized, uh, we usually have about 26 combination fatalities and serious injuries. Uh, we've got a double asterisk here on 2016 for serious injuries and non-motorized. Uh, the reason for that is that 2016 was a bad year. And uh, it's something of an extreme outlier. And if you look, if we look at or had the data here to show you the years before 2016, you'd see that this is uh, an outlier compared to the long-term trend. Uh, the reason why we chose not to use that to for our trend line analysis is because it kind of gives a false impression that things are improving um, when you do the trend line, and when in reality we're probably level over the last several uh, several years or the long-term trend is about level. And so we, we want to have kind of an honest conversation about this here uh, uh, about and, and about whether it's realistic to achieve a much uh, different goal than what perhaps we've considered in the past. So there are two things uh, being presented to us uh, right now. Uh, we have what's called the trend line target. This is what we've done in the past, 2% less than the long-term trend. 
And then there's the vision zero target, which is what it would take to get to zero fatalities or serious injuries or non-motorized by 2050. What you would notice is for 2021, it's not much of a change. I mean, it's, it's one year into a 30 year goal. So fatalities is only a reduction of one. Uh, serious injuries, it's a reduction of eight. Non-motorized, it's a reduction of two. But it doesn't take very long before these two uh, lines uh, significantly diverge. Uh, in the year 2025, yes, we're not adopting a target today for that, but looking into the future, uh, and that's only four years from now, uh, the difference in fatalities is now 13. Uh, the difference in serious injuries is 56. Uh, and then for non-motorized, the difference is eight. And it just gets uh, keeps um, becoming more and more different the further on you go. Uh, so it does beg the question, is this something that we can accomplish? Uh, and if not, is, is that still okay? So we've got some uh, charts here uh, that kind of just show what we've just shown you uh, graphically. So the blue line is what our average is, and this is for fatalities. You see that for 2021, the difference between the trend uh, which is in red and the vision zero target, which is in green is not much, but then becomes much more significant just four years from now. And we see the same thing for serious injuries here, same thing for non-motorized. Okay, so here's the questions that staff has, uh, has had. Uh, if we're going to go with zero fatalities by 2050 for, you know, uh, by 2050, then shouldn't we also do something like that for serious or the life-threatening injuries? Shouldn't we also do that for non-motorized? And then, okay, what do we actually have to do to actually accomplish that? Uh, not just for our region, but what does the state actually have to do to accomplish that? Uh, so um, before, well, we at a minimum have to at least consider the commission's actions on fatalities. Um, the rest uh, is similar, uh, or the state targets are identical to what uh, the state has adopted in the past. So we could continue supporting those targets um, without uh, necessarily a lot more conversation, but fatalities we have to at least consider. And so before we go any further here, we've done an analysis of fatal crashes in McLennan County to kind of give you an idea of what are some of the factors uh, that are involved in those types of crashes. So first we want to look at trend lines. Uh, at the bottom here in blue, these are all crashes uh, within McLennan County since 2010. And, it's a, and we've done a three-year rolling average to level out some of the variation from year to year that we see. Um, and this includes everything from fender benders to the worst. And what you see is a general upward trend of, of crashes, which actually is tracking very similar to growth in population and growth in uh, vehicle miles of travel within our region. The fatal crashes, which are at the top, this is in red. Uh, what was interesting is for about five years, uh, since 2010, we were actually seeing a gradual decrease in fatalities or fatal crashes. And then we reversed that. And now we're back to where we were about 10 years ago. Um, we don't necessarily have a great explanation for that, uh, but that is a concerning trend uh, in the short term. When we look at certain factors, uh, it, it's true what a lot of folks say, speed kills. Uh, this is uh, somewhat intuitive. The faster you go, uh, the more force is involved. Uh, and so uh, relative to all crashes, uh, speed is a factor about 10% uh, more of the time um, when you have a fatal crash. Uh, alcohol and drugs is where the, there's a really big difference. About a third of all cra fatal crashes involve alcohol or drugs. Uh, whereas it's only about one in 20 of all crashes. 
Uh, distraction and in, inattention uh, is getting a lot of uh, attention now uh, through cell phones and texting, uh, but interestingly enough, it's more of a factor for all other crashes, uh, but still not insignificant for fatal crashes. Uh, and then the failure, failure to yield right of way disregarding a traffic signal or stop sign. Um, again, because of the angle of these collisions, they are uh, more frequently an issue uh, in the fatal crashes uh, than total crashes. Some other factors, uh, bicycle and pedestrians. Uh, here, almost one in four crashes involved uh, bicyclist or pedestrian in McLean County since 2010. Um, whereas uh, for all crashes, it's just a mere fraction of the total. Uh, this is not a surprise here. Uh, bicyclists might be wearing a helmet, but have little protection otherwise. Uh, and of course, pedestrians have no protection at all. So if there's an interaction with a motor vehicle, it's usually not a good outcome. Um, I think the fact that we have such a high percentage of our fatal crashes involving uh, alternative modes uh, should be a cause for uh, concern because this, this is more than what the statewide average is. Uh, commercial vehicles, uh, again, uh, fatal crashes are a higher percentage. Uh, this is the laws of physics here. It's not because commercial vehicle drivers are bad drivers. Uh, it's that you've got a lot more weight involved, a lot more momentum. Uh, and so a uh, automobile uh, interacting with a commercial truck uh, is also not going to have a good outcome. Uh, fatal crashes are also overrepresented in rural areas. This is primarily, again, a speed-related issue. Uh, but also running off the road crashes are also a big factor. Uh, as uh, many of these rural roads do not have shoulders, uh, and uh, this is something that Textile has flagged on a statewide basis and is doing quite a bit of work of adding shoulders to their rural farmer market road system to try to, to reduce the, these numbers. Uh, State highways, again, it's a higher percentage, but again, this is also related to speed. State highways generally have higher speeds and higher speed limits than uh, uh, city or county roads. Uh, and then we looked at I-35 just because uh, it's something that uh, it, 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 um, it's a major uh, roadway within our region, carries a, a a large percentage of uh, vehicle miles travel for our region. Uh, but interestingly, uh, the numbers are about the same as far as uh, the percent of all crashes uh, for both types. Um, and then when we look at uh, day and time of day, um, time of day, overnight hours, more of a factor for fatal crashes. Uh, whereas the PM peak is, is the uh, primary time for all crashes. And then for days of the week, uh, again, fatal crashes are overrepresented in the weekend period. Uh, and there, and that it, both of those are related to uh, alcohol and drug involvement uh, as those types of crashes are also more uh, represented in the overnight hours and weekend period. Okay, so where do we go from here? Um, we're kind of at a point where we have to make a decision. Uh, we have to adopt or we have to make a decision as far as are we going to support state targets or adopt our own every year. And so what we're recommending um, as staff is that uh, at least for this year, uh, let's go ahead and support the state targets. The difference between uh, a vision zero target and the trend line target, at least for this next year, is very small. Um, and again, we're not supporting the vision zero necessarily, but we're supporting the number. Um, and so that means for uh, fatalities, it would be one less than what we would, would have considered with the trend line uh, for serious injuries. Um, actually, this difference would be if we decide to go the vision zero route. So. Um, so that, that's the difference between the two there and no non-motorized, uh, the difference is two. So uh, since the state has chosen not to do vision zero for those two metrics, um, that's something else that we 
could consider here. Under this recommendation, we wouldn't uh, we wouldn't apply Vision Zero yet to um, serious injuries or non-motorized. In the meantime, what we're proposing and what we'll propose to the policy board is that we need to establish a safety work group uh, because from the policy board's perspective, they've been uncomfortable adopting targets that set that imply a certain number of fatalities are okay or imply a certain number of serious injuries are okay, which just feels wrong. Uh, and so what we want to do is identify who needs to be at the table for this uh, and begin the conversations about, okay, what does it take to get to zero uh, on these particular metrics? It needs to focus more on just the engineering and design solutions. Uh, I think a study that we saw uh, a few years ago suggested that if we did everything we could from that perspective, and by the way, we only have a fraction of the resources to actually accomplish that, we'd still probably only get maybe a, a 10 or 15% reduction. Uh, and Zane, I see your hand is raised here, so uh, I assume you have a question. Yes, Chris, thanks. I This this is interesting what you're speaking about, but I, I wanna know if any thought has been given to the fact that McLennan County, as uh, the population has increased dramatically in the last five years, would you say? Uh, well, it's actually been, a, uh, we've had a fairly steady increase actually over the last 25 years and, and it has probably gone a little bit faster in the last five years, if anything. Um, but yeah, that, that does factor into this, that uh, if you see an increase in traffic, uh, you, you'll see an increase in crashes unless you do something very different. Um, and that's why we look at that crash rate statistic. It kind of holds that variable constant um, and, and gives us something to uh, at least consider, um, you know, um, to take that into account, if you will. It just seems um, that we would be running uphill to try to agree to, you know, to a, a statistics that are lower than previous years when we continue to add more traffic or more traffic continues to appear on our roads due to increased in, increase in population, which is statistically we're going to have more crashes. So we're already setting ourselves up for failure. But I just, that was my point. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, and I'd say from a staff perspective, that's a concern of ours also. Uh, we certainly share that. Um, but I think the, uh, and, and I can't speak for the commission, uh, but uh, some of what we've heard uh, from uh, TxDOT staff is that uh, part of what they're trying to accomplish is at, at least getting people to talk about what would it take to, to make a significant difference? Uh, how do we address the, the whole driver behavior issue, which is probably um, as much of an issue, uh, if not more so than, than the um, uh, condition or, or the uh, design of our roadways. Uh, and so um, since we're forced to ex consider the question, uh, we think that at least let's get the right people at the table talking about this over the next year and see if we can come up with some ideas um, that maybe can uh, at least get us pointed in a little bit different direction. Uh, I know uh, there's been a lot of publicity of late about the fact that we haven't had a zero fatality day in the state of Texas for 20 years now. Uh, and uh, and a lot of disappointment this last year that uh, when we saw the decrease in traffic volumes from the uh, COVID situation, we actually saw fatal crashes going the opposite direction. Instead of getting better, things got worse. Uh, and so, and there, there's, we know why that is now, um, but uh, trying to um, actually change uh, that is uh, another challenge altogether. So um, what we'd like to do is, is give the technical committee uh, the option of um, 
taking some action today. Um, we'll, we'll also give this uh, option to the policy board as well. Uh, we, we're supposed to adopt or, or make some sort of statement uh, that we're going to support the state targets this month. Uh, if we wait until March, we're probably not uh, impacting anything just yet, but we, we really, we do have to take some type of action probably within the next uh, 30 days or so. Um, but we'd like to open it up to any other questions or any other discussion that you might have uh, and, and then see if there's a particular direction you're in favor of. Chris, on that region specific target, what mm -hmm. size, how big is the region? Uh, McLennan County for us. My concern would be that um, we won't have the resources to implement a target if we if we take on a target that is too um, ambitious, that, that we need to be reasonable about that. Yeah. But I guess that being said, Chris, I could put myself behind supporting the tech stop targets while we convene this meeting of people, this task force to, to look at it in greater detail over the next year. I second that. Uh, I was going to ask that, Amy, that that sounds like a motion. Yes. <laughs> All right. So, okay. So that's to support state targets and Zane is a second. All right, um, any additional discussion on this? And um, let me just say that the, I imagine the technical committee is gonna be very involved in this uh, work group or, or members will be very involved in this work group. Chris, I would just like to add that I think just holding our numbers at an even would be doing something positive mm -hmm. just because we have an increase in population versus trying to make them, I mean, the goal is to reduce the fatality numbers, but with the increase in population, I think we'd be doing well just to hold them at the same rates that they've been. Okay. If the population continues to grow. Well, that's certainly an option for us um, that we can hold steady at 2020 at a 2020 level, that would be a region specific number for us. Um, if that's something you would prefer to consider, it's something that you think is more realistic. I'll still stand by my second. Um, I just wanted that to be one of note. Okay, we'll, we'll make that note and share that with the policy board when they um, uh, have their conversation in two weeks. Chris, I have a question. Yeah. So uh, not sure if this is really a, just a comment or a question, but um, has there been any consideration given to the increased volume of tourism um, and how that would impact um, the crash data? Well, that, that's where we get into the vehicle miles of travel statistic. Uh, so um, as, as that, as the vehicle miles of travel increase, um, what we'd like to see is that that number stay approximately the same. So if we have about one fatality per 100 million vehicle miles of travel, um, even though we might have more fatalities, um, if we're at if we stay at one fatality per 100 million vehicle miles of travel, it kind of takes into account that growth in, in volume and growth in population. And that's why those statistics are, are why we're required to look at those statistics. So if, if we see that number jumping up quite a bit, uh, then we know that there's something else going on that we need to address. Hi, Chris, this is uh, Anthony Beach. 
I, I was curious if the uh, injury and the fatality numbers for the bicycles breaks out electric bikes versus manual bikes. And the reason I say that is because electric bikes are much more dangerous. They can go up to 30, 40 miles per hour. Mm -hmm. And, and we're going to, if we don't see a lot of those today, they will be the majority of the bikes in the future. So Chelsea may have uh, a perspective on that. She's our bicycle and pedestrian planner. I can tell you, once she um, gets her perspective, I can tell you how they're handled in the uh, crash data that TxDOT uh, manages. Um, yeah, I was just going to say that I don't think the Chris system differentiates that. They just, right, they lump them into the, the non-motorized. And again, it's a non-motorized with a vehicle. Um, in terms of electric bike speed, I think right now, in order to be considered a bicycle, it has to be class two or under, something like that, which only goes up to 25 or 30 miles per hour. And then once you get into higher classes that go faster, where it's not, um, not pedal assist anymore, then you get into a different category. What I don't know is if those kind of in-between categories, how they're characterized in Chris, for example, even like a, like a, like a moped or something like that is kind of that in-between category. Right. So um, the honest truth is uh, it's kind of the interpretation of the police officer that's filling out the report sometimes. Uh, there is a moped category in the Chris system. Um, but uh, electric bikes uh, are not specifically identified. Uh, sometimes they're considered what's called a motorized conveyance, uh, which is kind of a catch-all for things where we don't know what to classify them as. Uh, so the, the little scooters that uh, you sometimes see uh, the elderly on, uh, that would be considered a motorized conveyance. Um, but uh, it's really, it's a, Unsatisfactory answer, I know, but uh, oftentimes it's kind of the judgment call of the police officer. Sure. Do we have any numbers on the scooters? I guess they're um, too new, but, uh, you know, we're going to see those rise also. Uh, yeah, so uh, we don't have any, um, well, the 2020 numbers are still preliminary for probably about another month or so. Uh, and so since the scooters came in uh, within the last six months, uh, we probably don't have a lot of information yet uh, on those. And again, uh, these are incidents that are reported to a police department. So if uh, something uh, happens where um, someone gets hurt, but the police are not uh, filling out a report, uh, unfortunately, we're not going to know about it. These are interesting questions, though, especially like Anthony, to your point of the future of electric bikes and how that will look and some of kind of the new generation of personal electric scooters that we're seeing too that are more like trikes. Um, that would be an interesting question for the Bicycle Advisory Committee that I sit on. Um, they're thinking about some new activities to work on in the next few years. And one thing that came up briefly in discussion is taking a look at the Chris reporting system for non-motorized um, accident reporting. And that's something I'll, I'll keep in mind and I'll mention to the group to consider. Excellent. That answers my question. Great. All right. Well, we do have a motion uh, on the table here. Uh, if, um, if we don't want to cut anyone else off, uh, if you have any other comments or questions, uh, please feel free to jump in. Uh, otherwise, we'll go ahead and call for a vote. Okay, I uh, don't see any or hear any, so uh, why don't we go ahead and take a vote. If you can unmute yourself and all in favor of the motion to uh, support the state crash or state safety targets for 2021, say aye. 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 And those that are opposed, uh, like sign. All right, we will recommend that to the policy board uh, and we'll probably have a conversation next month about uh, this work group and uh, getting your thoughts about who needs to be involved in that.
All right, uh, the next two are good. Well, actually, this one's going to be a, a little bit easier. Uh, this is Waco Transit's transit asset condition targets. Um, and uh, one of the things that we're interested in is that we have uh, uh, the rolling stock for our transit systems being in good condition. We want the uh, facilities that uh, our transit system uh, uses or, or um or, or has access to to be in good uh, condition as well. Um, there are three performance measures as part of this. Uh, we're looking at the percent of our revenue vehicles that are uh, beyond their useful life benchmark. Basically, are they old or not is really what we're after. Uh, and the FTA has a, spe a specific definition to what they consider being old. Um, equipment uh, is basically the non-revenue vehicles that uh, transit uses. And again, we want to know, are they old or not? And then for the facilities, uh, here's where we actually have a scoring uh, system. Uh, and what we're after is anything, we'd like the facilities to score uh, greater than a three on a five point system. And then we're also looking at the percent of elements that are considered less than adequate. Um, and so uh, similar to all uh, performance targets here, we're also looking at uh, uh, whether we're making progress at meeting those targets over time. And of course, we also are looking at the uh, projects that are within our planning process. Uh, how are they helping uh, the transit system achieve these targets? Uh, so 2020 recap, uh, and not only for 2020, but the years pre previously, the MPO has chosen to adopt the targets that Waco Transit has adopted. They're the only uh, operator in McLennan County, so uh, we really don't feel that makes sense to do something different. Uh, they're, they're the experts at uh, the condition of their system and, and what it takes to uh, improve the condition of their system. So uh, uh, we defer to uh, the expertise of our uh, friends at uh, Waco Transit uh, for those. And uh, there's a lot on this uh, chart here, but uh, one of the things that we want to note here is that uh, last year we did pretty well. Uh, we, we improved the uh, uh, percentage of the vehicles that were considered old, or we reduced those percentages. Uh, There's the introduction of a number of new vehicles like uh, buses, uh, cutaways, and, and some of the other uh, vehicle types. But now some of the vehicles that had not been replaced are now starting to exceed the useful life benchmark. And so uh, we went from 13% of the buses, which are primarily what we use for the fixed route system being old. Now we're going up to 40% being old. Uh, and what we see is uh, something similar for uh, all the other vehicle types. Uh, what we want to make a note of is that Waco Transit has discontinued using minivans as part of their fleet. Uh, so uh, after this year, we, you, um, unless they acquire some more, uh, we'll, we won't be tracking that statistic uh, as part of this. Then when we get to their facilities, uh, there are only two facilities that uh, meet the definition of facilities on, uh, for FTA. Uh, that's their maintenance and administration building and their intermodal terminal. Uh, and both of those uh, remain unchanged from last year. Uh, they've scored a 4.4 out of five for their overall condition. Uh, and 12% of their elements are rated less than adequate. An element could be something like their HVAC system or could be a lift that they use to elevate buses while they're doing maintenance on them or uh, uh, things like that. Uh, so um, generally, uh, their facilities are in pretty good shape. Um, may want to have a conversation in the future about uh, what it would take maybe to improve this 12% number. And so uh, our staff's recommendation is to uh, adopt the targets that Waco Transit has adopted for 2021. Uh, and we uh, 
may want to have a conversation about their fleet and uh, see if there's an opportunity to uh, add some newer vehicles into that fleet in the future. So at this point, we'll consider uh, any conversation or uh, if someone feels uh, uh, comfortable making a motion I'll make a motion to uh, adopt the targets established by the Waco Transit, MP, uh, Waco Transit. Okay. Second. 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 Okay. Then, sorry, I didn't catch that. Who is seconding? Me. <laughs> okay. Beatrice. All right. Thank you. Is there any discussion on the motion? Okay, seeing none, I'll go ahead and call for the vote. Uh, all in favor of adopting Waco Transit's transit asset condition targets for 2021, say aye. 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 And all opposed, like sign. And we will forward that recommendation to the policy board. Thank you. And then we get to uh, the target for travel time reliability, which is, um, in my opinion, more complicated than it needs to be, but uh, we'll try to walk ourselves through this. Uh, so travel time reliability uh, is trying to get at um, how consistent is travel time for uh, particular uh, parts of our transportation system. Um, Generally, the way it's been described to me is that most people don't complain that uh, their average travel time to work increased by two minutes this year. Uh, what they're complaining about is yesterday it took them 20 minutes to get to work and this morning it took them an hour. Uh, by the way, I don't know that actually the case, but, um, but uh, that's what this metric is trying to get after is uh, how, what is the variability in travel time for our interstate system and for the rest of the national highway system. Uh, so just like pavement and bridge targets, we're only looking at that small subset of our, of our system, the 11% of our lane miles that's classified as the national highway system. Uh, but again, it carries 60% of our regional travel. So these are the most important roadways in our region. Uh, similar to pavement and bridge targets, these are four-year targets. So we explored this back in 2018, adopted a set of, or yes, we adopted a set of targets back then uh, for the year 2022. And similar to pavement and bridge targets, we can consider a mid-course correction if uh, conditions are trending in a way that is different than what we anticipated. Um, for travel time, it's a little bit different process here. Normally, the state adopts a target such as they did for safety or pavement and bridge, and then we choose to either support or adopt something ourselves. Uh, here it's reverse. The MPOs have to adopt their targets first and because they influence what the statewide number is going to be. Now, for Waco, that's probably a really small number. Um, Dallas and Houston and Austin are probably going to drive this statistic a lot more than anything that uh, we're, we're going to do, but, um, but the process is a little bit different here. And just as a reminder, uh, this is a map showing the national highway system in McLean County. Uh, we have the one interstate highway being I-35, and then the facilities in red are the remainder of the national highway system, at least as it stands currently. Uh, so there are, there are technically three performance targets here, but we've lumped two of them together here because it's the same statistic, it's just for different parts of the national highway system. Uh, and we have to track uh, what percent of travel is considered reliable for the interstate system and then a separate statistic for the rest of the national highway system. And what we're looking at is the percent of that system that exceeds the 80th percentile travel time. And the best way I can describe this is that this is approximately, you know, what percent is worse than um, uh, the worst day in a typical month? 
Then the, the last statistic we're looking at is truck travel. Now, the US DOT chose to do something completely different here for uh, measuring that. Uh, it's not a percent of uh, the system, and, and also we're only looking at the interstate system for truck travel, but it's a ratio of um, the 95th percentile travel time compared to the average truck travel time. Best way this has been described uh, to me is that this is trying to approximate the worst travel day in a typical week, which is a much higher standard uh, than for all traffic. Okay, um, so we looked at this in 2018. Uh, we are very fortunate that we have folks at the Texas A&M Transportation Institute that crunch the numbers and give us a recommendation. Uh, and they do this for every MPO region in the state. Uh, we are prescribed to use the uh, data set that's uh, given to us by the University of Maryland. Um, and unfortunately, that data set changed in 2017, just before we considered these targets in 2018. Uh, and because of that, we could best describe the results as curious. Uh, so, for instance, uh, I-35 in our region was identified as being 100% reliable. So was the section of I-35 through Bell County, even though it was all torn up from construction during that year. Um, so, knowing that, we did adopt a set of targets uh, that were a little bit lower than what uh, the data was uh, suggesting, anticipating that okay, there's probably, uh, it's probably not as good as what that is, uh, that data set was suggesting. So in 2020, we have some more data and uh, I-35 reliability, at least for McLean County, has now come down to 88%. Okay, this is starting to make more sense to us. Uh, so let's note that most of the reconstruction of the interstate system has uh, been completed. Uh, the last section that's uh, remaining is the section in downtown Waco. And so if we consider that most of I-35 is operating 97, 99% reliable, that probably means that downtown's in that 65 to 70% range, which I think for everyone that's familiar with this, this situation and lives it, uh, would agree that's probably realistic. Uh, and that's, uh, now we have some confidence that this data is probably giving us some um, results that we can uh, uh, utilize. But what it means is that we've got to reconsider what we adopted in 2018. Uh, and so let's go to <clears throat> what we're uh, considering. So for the interstate system, for all traffic, what we adopted uh, two years ago was 95% uh, uh, reliable figure. Well, we now know it's going to probably be a lot less than that. Um, and so uh, TTI has recommended that we change that to 80% reliable. That's a little bit lower than maybe uh, we would really experience, but as I'll explain in a second, it's better to err on the side of being lower than what you expect um, um, than to uh, err going the other direction. For the rest of the system, uh, which are basically our freeways and principal arterials, uh, what we adopted was 85% la uh, last time. Uh, TTI actually suggested that that remain unchanged. However, there's an important piece of information that has changed since they made that recommendation. And I'll get that to that in the next slide, but the MPO staff is actually recommending that we lower that to uh, the same as the interstate, and that would be 80%. Um, and then for the truck statistic, uh, again, this is this is a ratio. It's not a, um, a percentage, and it, it, it's a unitless measure. But higher is less reliable. So in 2018, the recommendation is we should go with 1.4 uh, for the interstate uh, reliability for trucks. The proposed change is 1.75, so that's less reliable, <clears throat> but probably a um, little bit beyond what we might actually experience. So what are our considerations here? So we mentioned about the fact that we want to 
err on the side of uh, having a slightly worse target than what we expect. Um, there are no consequences uh, at the MPO side again, um, but because we do influence uh, TxDOT's targets, and if TxDOT fails to meet a target, they could uh, lose some flexibility on how they use federal dollars. Uh, and you know, we would like TxDOT to have the maximum flexibility to be able to apply their dollars where the net greatest need is, rather than have that being prescribed to them. Uh, so for the interstate, uh, we are uh, still going to have significant construction uh, through downtown Waco in 2022. So that's why we think the low, lower uh, reliability number makes sense. Uh, but the next time we go through this exercise, which would be for the year 2026, uh, that number should be greatly improved uh, by the time we look at that. And then for the rest of the system, uh, the mall to mall project, when we last looked at this, was going to be going to construction in 2023. That's after we were, were going to uh, figure out whether um, or do the uh, comparison to our target. Well, we just moved that project up a full year. Uh, so now we're going to have a really big, gnarly construction project impacting a, a pretty significant section of our uh, national highway system. Uh, in 2022. And so that's why we're recommending a bit lower target than what TTI was recommending um, initially. So um, hopefully that makes a certain amount of sense here. Um, and, uh, and so you have a couple of options here. You can either keep the targets that we adopted back in 2018 uh, you can adopt the recommendations that we've pr uh, presented to you today, or if you feel something different is more appropriate, you have that option as well. And before we get to that, I'm going to back us up uh, to the slide that shows you uh, what those uh, proposed changes are. Uh, and I will be happy to open it up to any questions or conversation at this time. And if, again, if anyone feels comfortable, uh, feel free to make a motion also. Chris, this is Zane. Um, it makes sense to me to uh, lower the reliability targets as um, suggested by staff and uh, the um, TTI simply because those two items, well, the one item you mentioned that the mall to mall got moved up a year. And then the second thing is that, um, you know, we have that Amazon industry being built and there's some other large industries that are about to be built and that's going to increase truck traffic tremendously. Mm -hmm. So I, I think lowering the targets or lowering reliability would be a step in the right direction. Right. With that, I make a motion to approve the TTI and Waco uh, recommendation. Thanks, Zane. I'll second that. And second by Tom. Thank you, Tom. Uh, any conversation on that motion? So we explained this perfectly well to everybody. See a few smiles. Um, okay, well, if there's uh, no conversation here, I'll call for the vote. Uh, so all those in favor of uh, changing our travel time reliability targets to uh, what we see on the screen here, uh, please say aye. 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 And those opposed, like sign. All right, thank you. We will forward that recommendation to the policy board. And so now we're at that time that uh, I think everyone's really been waiting for, and that is the update on construction from uh, TxDOT. And I believe Jeff Jackson is going to cover us uh, uh, this one. And uh, Jeff, uh, do you have uh, slides here? Jeff, if you're trying to talk, you're muted. Let's 
see. Jeff's with us. Yeah, Jeff's here. Let me unmute him. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, sir. No. All right. I'm sorry. I was trying, phone trying to unmute and it wasn't going. <laughs> uh, Jeff, do you have slides uh, for this? Whoops. I'll go ahead and stop sharing here. Uh, and so if you have something to um, pull up. There we are. We're not hearing you, Jeff, if you're talking. Let me try. I think this is probably you as the call on user. Let me try this. Is it working now? Yes. Okay, sorry. All right. Uh, as most of you may know, Hot 35, some things we've got going on right now um, are upcoming. The big one is the traffic switch for the uh, main lane traffic to put on new southbound main lane paving, uh, looking to make that switch at the end of this month. And then that, so after that switch, um, that'll be from new, uh, put traffic on new pavement from uh, 77 down to the south end, uh, south end of the job. Uh, shortly after that, within probably another month, they're going to look at switching the remainder of the main lane traffic to new pavement on the southbound main lane. So we'll kind of go through these aerials and kind of show how that's coming together. Um, this photo here, we can see uh, Loop 340, you can see the, the temporary Barron's on-ramp southbound. Um, we're looking north here. Uh, that they're part, they're, you can see they've got a lot of pavement ready to, uh, ready to go. They've got steel tied. In fact, I think they started paving a lot of this. They'll be shifting this ramp in the next um, few weeks to, to the new permanent location so they can make this pavement tie in. Um, here's a better look at it here. You can see the, the new on-ramp uh, coming up. Um, I don't know if y'all can see my mouse or not. But coming up here, you can see the new on-ramp where Barron's will tie in. Um, a lot of that, they've got asphalt down there. They've actually started paving a lot of this with their, what we're showing now. These pictures are, you know, two weeks old, so they're ancient history by now. Uh, you can see here, we've got another look at Barron's. Uh, you can see the main lanes coming together. This will be part of the later shift at the end of March. Um, here is the uh, current exit ramp. Looking, We're looking south here uh, to 84. Uh, as you can see, um, the new ramp is taking shape here. This one will open um, with, the new, with the new switch uh, so they can make, or prior to the, the new switch, so they can tie in the section of pavement. Uh, looking here, uh, looking north from 84, and better look at the, the southbound exit ramp to 84 and the new the permanent ramp taking shape there. Um, we've already, we poured this 84 bridge deck. Uh, they've been working on the approaches and paving paving approaches on each side of that, I'm getting ready for the shift. Um, here's, a, here's looking south. Um, this is the braided ramp uh, taking shape there from uh, exit to Elm Street. And the on ramp there, and the plan is for this to be uh, tied in with the um, the shift at the end of March, so that they're making good progress there. Uh, some more main lane pavement. If you haven't tell, you can, can't tell that's the uh, main focus for the last several weeks, and then remaining a uh, couple weeks leading into the shift. So they're they're pushing this paving hard. Uh, you can see here. This, the shift at the end of February when they bring main lane traffic onto the new southbound uh, main lane paving that's going to happen right here between uh, 84 and 77. So you can see right here where this uh, comes together at grade, this is where the, that first shift will, will happen. Uh, here's a look at 77. We poured that bridge deck and that's complete. Uh, they did that last week, so uh, making progress there. 
uh, some more more paving uh, coming down moving down south as you can see it's starting to take shape shape further south we go they've got a lot more of it in uh, here's looking at Forest Street looking south. Uh, here's the temporary exit ramp. They've got the MLK right here at Forest Street now. They'll be tying in the the new ramp here um, as they make the shift by the end of the month is the plan. Here's looking at the uh, bridge over EPRR looking south. And again, I think a lot these pictures are a couple weeks old. They, I believe they've got all this paved now on the main lanes southbound. Another look at EPRR, uh, looking north from here. And here you can see at the river we've got the uh, this will be this new ramp here will be the will service U Parks and Fourth Street uh, southbound. This should be tied in with the new switch by the end of the uh, that they're planning on doing by the end of this month. Um, so that'll that'll be a welcome change. Not have to go through MLK U Parks and Fourth and Fifth. You'll just have you'll exit directly to U Parks there. Um, so that they're working on getting that tied in as well. Uh, here's looking at University Parks. Like I said, they've got all these inside and outside lanes that are ready here. These are these are now paved, um, so making good progress there. Uh, here's looking at looking south at Fourth Street. Uh, as you can see, the bridges in place and uh, concrete paving. I believe they've got everything set to the south paved here. So we're again we're getting close. I'm getting that switched. Um, we'll update on Fourth Street. I believe they've got uh, they've got the materials in to do that water line, the 24 inch water line tie in at Fourth Street. So hopefully they can get get in there and get that work done over the next several weeks, and then hopefully look at getting that uh, Fourth Street opened up. I think priority right now for the like we said is going to be getting the main lane traffic switch switches in uh, once we, they get uh, this upcoming switch at the end of this month, and then the full switch. Uh, into phase three by the end of March. After at that time, you'll see a lot more work on these side streets and tie-ins, uh, getting some of the pavement done. Um, that opens up a lot more work at these bridges um, once we get traffic switched. Here's looking looking back north at Fourth Street. Um, kind of see it a little bit here, but we've got the new. Uh, we'll be getting a new on ramp coming back on uh, there before 17, 18th Street, so we don't have to go through that light going south uh, once we get this switch done. So that'll be it. That will be tied in with this switch at the end of this month in February. Here's a better look at it. You can see it further up here where that new on-ramp is going to be, be that permanent on-ramp. And here's looking south at 17, 18th Street, uh, the temporary exit ramp. Um, as you can see here, uh, they've got they're working on getting the permanent ramp tied in. So once they get the uh, traffic switch, they can or when they make that traffic switch, the new ramp will be tied in uh, to 1718. So that won't be as a dramatic exit there uh, as we've been dealing with for the last several uh, months. Uh, and then as far as northbound goes, I know we've got the northbound. Let me go back up a little bit. The uh, you can see here the northbound frontage road. Um, we've had that closed between 17th and 8th Street and 8th Street for a while. Uh, they're looking at getting that tied in. Uh, that should be tied in with this upcoming switch at the end of February. As you can see here, they've got a lot of the pavement already in. They just got to make this tie in, and they should be good there. Other than that, the focus has been main lane paving like crazy. So they've been doing that for this last several weeks, and hope to finish that out by the end of this month to make the first switch and then wrap up the rest and get and that way they can move on to the next phase. Um, are there any other questions? Anything I've uh, missed or went over? Uh, Jeff, uh, so when we make this uh, switch over at the end of the month, uh, it appears that the new uh, pavement is going to be wider than what we're using right now. Is that correct? Correct. It'll be Yes, you'll have. It's not going to be substantial, but there will be there there will be more room. Uh, the lanes will be about the same size. It should be 11, 11 and a half feet. Uh, but the, you'll have a little bit more shoulder. Uh, so the optical illusion there will be that we have a lot more room in the lanes. So it won't be as tight. You'll still be in a shoot with barrier on either side, but it won't be as bad or as dramatic as we're in now. Yes, and then it'll be all new concrete, which will be nice also. Correct. 
correct. We shouldn't have to worry about potholes or anything like that, like we've been dealing with for the last two years. Yes. All right. Uh, well, thanks, Jeff. Uh, any questions for Jeff? All right. Well, uh, as always, we really appreciate the updates. Uh, and uh, it definitely looks like we're making progress. All right, let's um, go back to where we've been. And actually, I think we did that. All right. Uh, so let's uh, do the director's report here. Uh, so uh, we have a couple of minor adjustments uh, to the uh, tip that uh, we have to uh, at least bring you uh, some awareness of before I became actually official. Uh, there was one project um, in the transportation alternatives that actually uh, is going to be going to construction fiscal year 22. Uh, and then there were some minor adjustments to the project costs. Uh, but uh, those are uh, uh, well within the percent of uh, that were allowed for um, variability um, between the tip and, and uh, tip letting. Uh, the more significant one that we want to bring you up to speed on is the mall-to-mall uh, -mall project. Again, it's uh, not a huge uh, amount in terms of total cost, um, but uh, what we are told is for this year, uh, the mall to mall project was only authorized for 44 million, but that uh, the anticipation is that the additional two and a half million will probably be reapplied to the project uh, when we get to uh, the new fiscal year. Uh, so there's not additional action that we have to take here, but uh, we wanted to make you aware that uh, when it uh, shows up in the actual tip, it's actually going to show up slightly less. Um, and then uh, we'll be looking at this project um, with the additional dollars, uh, and this is primarily for the incentive package uh, to expedite construction. Um, we'll be looking at that being added back in uh, probably in September. So uh, let me just see if, you, if there are any questions related to that. So the uh, next item is our next meeting is going to be uh, March 4th. Uh, the consultants who are doing work on the bus rapid transit design and engineering study um, are starting to uh, wrap up their work on that and they want to give us an update on where they are with that project. Um, we're also going to add in the uh, topic of uh, this uh, safety work group that we'll be putting together and um, start identifying some things that you, the technical committee, uh, think that group needs to uh, look at or discuss, and then also identifying who needs to populate that work group. And then, of course, we'll get, have the uh, construction update from TxDOT. Um, no surprise that we're going to continue meeting virtually. Uh, probably uh, more important to let you know when we will no longer be meeting virtually, although it's starting to look like that, at least for this fiscal year, um, there's probably not going to be a change there. All right, that's what I have for you today. Uh, if Let me know if there's any questions or if there are things uh, that you would like the technical committee to discuss. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me at any time.